Uh, I want to welcome you all here uh, to LaborFest. My name is Steve Zeltzer, and LaborFest began actually 28 years ago, uh, a long time ago, to commemorate the 1934 general strike and to you know, commemorate the workers who made that strike, as well as the workers today here in San Francisco and the country and around the world. And one of the uh, aspects of Labor Fest is to uh, un understand the history of um, the working class in regard to racism and xenophobia and, uh, I, and how that divides and pits worker against worker. And this Labor Fest is taking place now in a time in which um, uh, not only black and brown and immigrants and women and uh, G GBLTQ people have come under attack, but Asians and Asian Americans. And it's, it's got a long history, which we're going to be talking about this evening. Uh, but Labor Fest believes that it's critical that working people know about that history and to understand what it is and, and how we can overcome um, the, the systemic racism and the great I'll harm to it a little that bit. has been done to, uh, Maybe you go first. done to the people of this country through uh, these um, dangerous the racist ideologies. So um, we're first going to uh, have uh, our first speaker is Grace Shimizu, and she, or is it Miho? Which one are you going to go first? We're going to go together. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a joint, a joint presentation. Okay, so joining that. us now is Miho Kim and Grace Shimizu, and welcome to Labor Fest. You want to say something first? And then... Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve, for having us, and hello to everyone. It's really an honor. My name is Miho Kim. I'm with the Comfort Women Justice Coalition in San Francisco. Um, well, actually, we're both a part of that coalition, and um, here is my name is Grace Shimizu, and I'm with the. Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project and the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. Um, so just a quick intro, we um, have within our segment a short film to show um, and then we'll be sharing a few words and we'd love to hear from you all your thoughts and insights as well. But what, um, you know, what's interesting about the two of us is um, you know, we both come personally from families what, that have been affected by this whole xenophobic policy of the state as it really um, hunkered down on the war effort and imperial expansion um, prior to and all the way through World War II. And the issues that we'll be talking about. Um, I'm so sorry, this is my cat. Um, this is area of doing everything out of your tiny apartment. Um, but, um, and so the two issues that we'll be talking about, I will focus more on the issue of, um, I'm so sorry, my cat is not really trained well. You can tell who's a pushover in this house um, of the comfort woman. Um, issue and Grace will be talking about the uh, Japanese Latin American history, but these two issues um, happen to be unresolved, unfinished business from World War II, and um, it's a history of xenophobia, and I think it has a lot of relevance to the topic that we're going to be addressing today. So um, with that, oh, and the other thing is a uh, land acknowledgement. You want to do that? Yeah. So uh, before we start, just wanted to um, say that uh, we're joining you from the place now known as El Cerrito, California, which is within the territory of Huchuin, the ancestral land of many tribes of the Ohlone people. The Ohlone peoples have been and continue to be stewards of this land, and we acknowledge the strength of their communities to survive the devastating effects of dispersal and genocide white supremacy and settler colonialism in the Americas. Uh, in this area where we live, uh, the Ohlone people have founded the Sogoriate uh, Urban, uh, excuse me, um, Land Trust and uh, invite non-native people, settlers, to make an annual donation, a gratitude tax for living and working here. This is a small part of mending the toxic and broken relationships among our peoples and our peoples and their land. So if you can make a contribution, please Google Shumi Land Tax to get to the website. That's Shumi, 
S-H-U-M-M-I land tax. So thank you. So, you go oh. okay, so um, I think usually uh, when we talk about World War II and we talk about the um, incarceration of uh, an imprisonment of people during that time in the United States, uh, people think about the incarceration of the Japanese Americans. But um, I guess what I wanted to uh, show is that, um, that more people were actually imprisoned and that it's not just an issue of imprisonment, uh, but also of deportation and massive uh, human rights and civil liberties violations that actually, um, you know, initiated by the United States with the collaboration of Latin American countries and uh, spanned two continents. So um, here, I think in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area in California, many of us have heard about the Japanese American incarceration. So I won't kind of uh, delve into that so much, but uh, that is the, um, imprisonment about, of about 120,000 men, women, and children, uh, both immigrants and US citizens of Japanese ancestry. What people don't usually realize is that um, the, uh, in the United States, the US government also had a program for um, other potentially dangerous enemy aliens. And that would be uh, persons of German and Italian ancestry. Um, and then in, uh, included with them is also the rendition or the kidnapping of over 6,000 uh, people from Latin America of Japanese, German, Italian, and also Jewish ancestry. And so what we have is um, actually the imprisonment of about 150,000 men, women, and children. Um, and also uh, the chilling effect that their imprisonment had on their communities. And so this affecting millions of people. Uh, so in addition to the um, imprisonment, um, there's also deportation because people were used in hostage exchanges. And then at the end of the war, you know, the devastation that happened to their communities and these families and their struggles to um, survive and also then to hold the US government and their respective countries accountable for the violations that took place. So um, let me just check in with you guys since we have a small group here. Is people, are people familiar with the, uh, what happened to the Japanese Latin Americans during World War II? While, people, while uh, Pearl Harbor happened, what we saw in Hawaii and the mainland of the United States was people started disappearing, whether they were Japanese, German, or Italian immigrants. And uh, what, it also happened in Latin America in about 18 countries. And then, uh, uh, so then um, these folks were classified as potentially dangerous enemy aliens and uh, they, in the United States, they, um, the U.S. government set up camps. So usually you hear about um, the people of Japanese ancestry that were put into 10 war relocation authority camps. Well, there was a whole nother set of camps that people don't know about run by the Department of Justice and the U.S. Army. And they numbered like in about 50 or more kind of facilities spread out from Hawaii to the mainland. And so um, people started to disappear and then uh, families were separated. And then um, people got word that the, their, uh, usually the head of the household, uh, the father or the grandparents were in these camps. And then in Latin America, that similar process happened as well, except um, they learned that they were being shipped to um, the United States. Uh, and uh, at first they didn't know why, but then it, be, uh, it was revealed that they were to be used in hostage exchange. 
And so this was an exchange, a humanitarian program, which supposedly is supposed to return immigrants um, who were um, from warring countries, you know, so that they could return home safely. But it turned into a massive uh, human rights violation program where the United States and the collaboration of Latin American countries, um, you know, needed uh, hostages to exchange for US citizens caught in the Far East and the uh, European war zones. And so um, they scooped up the, um, you know, people from Latin America that were about 6,000. And since it was a one for one exchange, it became quite expedient for them to also not only take the heads of households who were leaders of their communities, just like in the United States, like businessmen, uh, ministers, uh, priests, um, judo instructors, journalists, teachers like that, um, but also to then uh, go after their families so that they could, uh, um, I guess that's called family reunification, but actually it was for the purpose of, you know, uh, raising numbers for the hostage exchange. For the Japanese, there were two that happened. And then um, for the Germans, we know there were uh, from the United States, there were at least five or six exchanges. And we're learning more about more that actually happened also uh, the expelling of people, German people from Latin America, and they didn't stop off in the US. And then we know of 81 Jewish people that were taken from Latin America and brought to the US. And then some of them actually got sent back to Europe, uh, uh, you know, under Nazi occupation. So um, we're learning more about it, it's terrible. So then um, after the exchanges um, at the end of the war, the US, you know, said, well, we don't want these uh, dangerous enemy aliens to remain in the Western hemisphere. So they started deporting people to war-torn Europe or Japan. Uh, and in Japan was under US military occupation. Uh, for the Japanese, only maybe a hundred people were able to return to Peru, um, uh, often because they were married to Peruvian citizens or were themselves uh, Peruvian citizens. But uh, pretty much people had to learn to survive. And then um, that was the uh, main thing is just learning to adapt and for, you know, many of the Japan, uh, uh, Japanese Peruvians who were kids, the English or Japanese was not their first language, you know, so it was very hard. And then also the, uh, for both Germans and Japanese, there was a lot of suspicion of who were these people coming from the United States, you know, even though they might have been, you know, uh, originally from Latin America. So anyway, uh, uh, what we show in the video is for the Japanese Latin Americans, we uh, have an ongoing redress struggle. Um, Japanese Americans were able to get redress um, under the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, but the Japanese Latin Americans were excluded because we had been classified by the US government as illegal aliens, even though it was the United States that brought us here. So then uh, we've been trying since then to um, fight for acknowledgement and reparations. There have been different lawsuits and attempts to pass legislation. There's been some concessions made to the um, Japanese Peruvians, but uh, it's not con we don't consider it as a real apology nor um, uh, justice. And then for the Germans and Italians too, they have struggled for acknowledgement as an apology as well, but they too have had limited um, success. So it's an ongoing struggle. And I think, um, I should monitor my time. Um, so I, I think what we're trying to show here through the experience of the um, people of Japanese ancestry from the US and from Latin America and our experience during World War II is to show how uh, US uh, or government policies um, 
and also the racism and xenophobia that existed um, uh, led to such massive human and civil uh, rights violations. And um, that this, that condition that um, happened in World War II has a long history. And um, so that the discussions, I think um, one of the scholars, Erica Lee has shown that um, since the mid 1800s, there's been actually a transnational discussion about migration, race and national security in the Asia Pacific and the Americas. And that um, this has, uh, so attention has been given to the so-called threat of the migration of Asians, particular Chinese, Japanese, South Asians, and most recently West Asians. Mm -hmm. So we've been, um, you know, deemed unfair, cheap economic competition, disease, immoral, unwilling, or unable to assimilate, a threat to Christianity and the white way of life. So we've seen increase of anti-Asian racism and uh, campaigns to exclude. Asian immigration. So uh, since then, you know, race and racism has gone global, affecting migration patterns and even the processes of nation building. So um, let's see. And in from the mid 19th and early 20th century, the Asians who have been migrating have been among the largest groups to do so, especially in the Americas. And this is a transnational migration with uh, diasporic communities being formed, which retain connections to their homelands and forming networks across national borders. But at the same time, transnational anti-Asian racism and xenophobia has flourished. So Asians were the targets of the, some of the first national immigration laws that excluded migrants based on uh, race as well as being victims of state-sanctioned violence, expulsion, and incarceration. So what we've seen is the restrictive immigration laws in the U.S. have actually prompted the redirecting of Asian migration around the uh, Western Hemisphere and have get, uh, given rise to so-called um, illegal, uh, what do you call it, um, immigration. A coral Larry. Um, to a similar time in history, which is about the comfort women. And I just want to um, express, you know, uh, thanks and solidarity with many folks on this call um, who have been in a really critical part of the effort to erect um, the Comfort Woman Memorial here in San Francisco. Um, the Voice of Labor um, United, um, along with other, you know, anti war groups, uh, women's groups, peace groups have um, really, really proven to be the determining factor of whether or not the Board of Supervisors would um, support erecting a memorial that basically honored hundreds and thousands of faceless, nameless girls and women across the Asia Pacific who um, basically perished, over 90% of whom perished as comfort women during World War II. Um, and what I want to do is uh, maybe try to draw out some lessons um, from this history and uh, think about some choices that we have for shaping the course of our future, um, you know, as a part of this whole festival or labor fest, excuse me. <laughs> um, and what I think I can contribute as a Zainichi Korean, I'm a third generation um, Korean. My grandfather was actually a forced laborer uh, from Korean Peninsula. Uh, taken to Japan to work in the coal mines during World War II um, to support Japan's war effort. And when Japan um, declared total defeat um, in 1945, my grandparents were one of the two million or so um, very, very poor, mostly illiterate um, peasant um, day labor, you know, uh, uh, labor Koreans that um, had no choice but to remain in Japan. Um, and shortly after, you know, um, that, that whole chaos, Korean War broke out and 
um, Japan imposed capital flight prohibition from Japan, and these people were not about to go back to their motherland that, you know, where their family had no land without a single penny to their name. And so that's how I was born more, maybe 30 years after the war ended. But I want to just weave through my personal um, perspective as a Zainichi and talking about um, this history and reflecting. Um, by no means I'm um, an expert scholar um, in this area, um, but I hope this can feed into some insights. So um, basically the dominant narrative that Japan has cre um, that Japan has ceased being an imperial power. Um, and you know, especially that thanks to the guiding hands of the US, you know, helping it emerge as Asia's first democracy, you know, as an independent nation in 1952, I think obscures the nature of the issues that continue to haunt us um, as uh, um, us as in the, the survivors of Japan's colonial um, occupation of Korea and other places, um, including the comfort woman um, as unresolved, unfinished business of World War II. Um, and so we have a situation where victims of the Japanese empire continue to experience the ongoing continued violation while the empire um, itself, the very perpetrator of the violations themselves have um, purportedly ceased to exist any longer. Um, the actual events of the violations have passed. So the comfort women are no longer comfort women. Yet the experiences of those events still prevail into the present. And the comfort women are to this day fighting for restoring their dignity and rights. And this is where the UN um, former top chief high commissioner for human rights, Navi Pillai has declared the this is not a issue of the past, that it's a contemporary issue um, as the human rights violations of these women continue into the present. Um, and so how does xenophobia um, factor into this? And also what does this history um, teach us anything about xenophobia? And I think what's going on with the United States. Um, one thing, several things actually that quickly stood out to me when thinking about the political conditions that gave rise to these abhorrent practices of enslavement and sexual, uh, excuse me, not sexual slavery only, but really slavery-like forms of exploitation is that um, forced labor, sexual enslavement, these systemic exploitations are almost always inhospitable to workers' rights and um, that the human rights of workers and vulnerable um, colonized uh, people, particularly women, are intertwined. Um, and oftentimes, they, um, the undermining of one party's rights um, also undermines the other. And the, um, in the context of fascism, because by you know, early, um, by the onset of World War II, you know, prior to that, Japan was trying to join the League of Nations, right? And Japan, I think, was maybe the first nation that actually proposed racial equality in the Treaty of Versailles negotiations. But Wilson and everybody rejected it. And my Australia was like full on with their full assimilation policy with the Aboriginal peoples and you know, the Europeans and, and the, in the US, right here in California, there was an alien land law passed. You know, the, the um, nationality could not be passed down. Um, to, to descendants, um, if you were um, Asian or people of color. Um, there was a lot of xenophobic um, acts against um, Asian immigrants here in San Francisco right around that time as well. And when there is rise of fascism and um, th that Japan has basically entered after being rejected in the League of Nations as equal parties, you know, they said that we have to play the, the, the European and the Western um, game on their game board because otherwise we'll be taken over just like all of Africa by that time and, you know, all of Latin America by that time as well. And um, that's where the, the, the elites um, basically came together and pushed to modernize and specifically um, set out to um, expand the empire of Japan. Japan, the constellation of thousands of tiny volcanic islands that are constantly suffering earthquakes, mudslides, very resource poor. What do they have other than the chance to survive as a sovereign nation through conquest of other territories, such as the one in the continent with robust resources, right? Um, so the utility of the labor 
contributed by workers, women, I feel like is exclusively measured and valued in terms of benefit for the national war effort and not for the person or families or for the communities or the culture that sustain life. And enemy aliens, quote unquote, um, seem to be often manufactured where rifts all already exist. And it always um, seems to be very effective in helping distract the mass population from the core cause of their hardship, right, economic hardship, um, as we're all familiar from wherever we may be from, to direct their frustrations away from the state. And also within the society, create a sense of hierarchy and class. And it provides a, a false sense of security. Um, in alignment with the state. And uh, at the same time, workers and women are essential for the war effort and to keep the war machine going. And, you know, in Japan, um, by 1910, Japan had colonized the Korean Peninsula. Korea became a part of Japan. And former finance minister Aso, that uh, many of us might be familiar with, his own family in 1911 became the first uh, sort of uh, huge uh, company employer to bring thousands of laborers from the Korean Peninsula to use for hard labor um, in the history of modern Japan. And thereafter, it continued to increase. Um, and uh, by, uh, what did I mention also? Um, that I think, so Korea in 1910 was a part of Japan and 1918, by this time, the rice riots happened, which is basically that Japan was trying to really industrialize and advance all the preparations to wage inter-imperialist war with the West, that the farmers were going hungry left and right and nationwide farmers organized and rioted like never before. Um, incidentally, the Japanese government started to help administer mass emigration from Japan to places like Latin America where Grace's family landed or Hawaii or to the west coast of the United States from right around that time. And 1922, the Communist Party was founded in Japan. Um, this is where I just want to invoke the legacy of the workers and the internationalist spirit that is, I think, also a part of our history. Um, this is a very dark era in a history of our peoples. But like this poster right here, I don't know if you can see, but it's a poster of an international gathering of workers, farmers with the Korean people. So the Japanese and the Korean people coming together in solidarity to speak against fascism. And this is right at the time when imperial expansion of Japan really had to um, be justified on this ideological um, teaching that the Japanese were the superior race and the emperor was the demigod, right? And the people that did not have the Japanese blood were less pure and inferior, but we're close enough with the Japanese, you can't tell us apart, that if we tried hard enough that we can become Japanese. So that was a teaching. And um, why do I mention this is because the comfort woman system started with this backdrop. This was all the ideological preparation and the Manchurian incident happened there was a huge justification through the state media and everything that this was just, you know, God's intended will for Japan to go enlighten the people um, on the continent. And the following year, 1932 in Shanghai, with the new brigades being established, was the very first comfort station established. And thereafter, hundreds and hundreds popped up wherever Japanese military stationed themselves. Um, and just a side note, Japan's former prime minister Nakasone wrote in his autobiography that he was a very young uh, military official 
um, involved with establishing the whole administrative side of the Shanghai Comfort Women system that became the model for the rest of them to, to pop up throughout Asia through 1945. And that his bookkeeping system he came up with was so great that he was commended and actually promoted for it. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, so that that's that the part of comfort women system I think that's not often talked about. Um, and at the end of World War II, hundreds of um, well, I don't know about hundreds, but at least tens of thousands of women were supposedly um, you know rescued and uh, released. And <clears throat> basically, um, many of them were also. Um, placed by the occupying U.S. military forces to serve as prostitutes in places that U.S. military took over, such as in Okinawa and the remote islands of Okinawa after 1945. And so our comfort women struggle today really oftentimes warrants that we look at the intersection of militarism and fascism along with misogyny that have enabled um, rape and uh, uh, sexual violence against women oftentimes to be seen as uh, a war trophy, you know, and a thing that just um, happens along, you know, war, which we know the international community in recent years have spoken against. And um, the most encouraging thing, I think, on a global scale is the um, declaration that sexual violence in conflict is a crime against humanity. And this is written into the Rome Statute uh, at the International Criminal Court, thereby reversing thousands of years of what was considered normal. Um, however, the justice for comfort women struggle continues. And I think where um, local, uh, local as in San Francisco where I'm based and many of us are based, um, have really played a critical role in terms of advancing their justice is really fighting Japan's historical denialism. Um, the first prime minister of Japan in post-war Japan was plucked out of Sugamo prison, a war criminal, Prime Minister Kishi, who is prime minister, former Prime Minister Abe's grandfather. Um, he led the empire of Japan in a lot of its military endeavors, and the U.S. picked Suga, and in negotiating Japan's sovereignty, which happened in 1952, Kishi insisted Koreans in Japan, although they were forced to become Japanese as a part of the empire of Japan and colonized people until 1945, and they were there in Japan as a result of, you know, Japan's doings, they were either Reds or criminals. This is what's recorded um, in the transcript. I have not seen it myself, but according to a historian in Japan, um, in a transcript, they're reds or criminals, and therefore they do not deserve Japanese nationality, even if they were gonna live there in perpetuity. And sure enough, I'm third generation born and raised in Japan. We are to this day denied Japanese nationality. How does this relate to the comfort women issue? Well, Zainichi Koreans such as myself, comfort women, other people who are speaking to the truth of what Japan did and the footprints that are still not wiped clean of its blood to this day are being silenced and our voices need to be fundamentally uh, in, uh, uh, uncredible. How do you say Dis the, we need to be discredited because the silencing effort you know, have not succeeded. You know, the grandmothers have been very vocal internationally and here in the Bay Area as well. Um, but this is where xenophobia plays a huge part. Today in Japan, Korean hate crimes uh, against the Korean, Dainichi Korean people, and also the just vehement attacks against comfort women, and also former Congressman Mike Honda, who helped pass House Resolution uh, 207, um, which you know basically um, unified the voice of U.S. Congress in calling on the Japanese government to take full legal responsibility for the comfort women issue, um, as you know, um, um, sellouts, anti-Japanese, um, not to be trusted, Japan haters. Um, and, and so the xenophobia and the attacks um, that are really fueled by decades of racial, racialized sort of ideology that never really was replaced with 
uh, uh, um, ideology of equality and egalitarianism after the war ended continue to fuel and embolden the right wing um, forces in Japan that are denying the World War II era history because that directly cast doubt on the quote unquote glorious legacy of the Japanese empire. And the way the Japanese um, government today is, um, you know, putting restrictions on, um, you know, um, of financial, you know, um, sectors, and also um, call, uh, passing the equivalent of the Patriot Act um, in Japan, you know, such measures individually might seem rather innocuous, but as we all know here, are all steps that all together in totality can be seen as stepping stones towards readying for an all out assault. And this is happening right when Okinawan people, the majority of them are protesting more expansion of Japanese and US military. And yet the Japanese and US military expanding beyond Okinawa to Miyako Islands, Yaejima Islands, all around Okinawa within Japanese territorial um, jurisdiction. And so I think the comfort women issue itself is a human rights violation issue. Um, and um, as well as it representing a larger um, you know, stake for the Japanese government to really try to revive its right wing aspirations um, again. And so I hope that, you know, as workers have the ability to fuel the war machine, but also to stop the war machine. And uh, Steve mentioned the legacy of the general strike. And, you know, I think, I think there's just a lot of people power that I think, you know, we can um, force to bear on, on, on this issue. Oh, something about the predicament of Chinese people um, in the United States over the last hundred years or so. Uh, and then, you know, the what Steve mentioned about the role of trade unions and the, the left, a lot of the, the support that national minorities in the U.S. should have reasonably expected from the left, from the communists, from the trade unions, didn't materialize. And in many respects, the unions and the, and the political parties played a pretty poor role in the defense of Chinese people's rights, and they still do a poor job today, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, by 1880, the, um, you know, the railroad link had been built between California and the West, and there were actually 100,000 Chinese people in the US um, by 1880. It's a lot of people. And all, most all had come to build the railroads or to work in the, in the West. Um, and it was in 1882 that um, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act um, uh, that barred immigrants uh, coming from China to settle in the US and then achieve uh, citizenship. Although um, California had been barring Chinese citizenship since 1849. So, um, the, uh, in 1904, the U.S. Congress extended the Chinese Exclusion Act indefinitely. Um, and then um, in terms of the turmoil, um, the important impact of the Ref Russian Revolution on the left in the United States, one of the things that happened was the Palmer raids and the, the first Red Scare attack on the left. And interestingly, uh, their first Palmer Raid, their first Red Scare incident in New York City was a raid on an IW, a Chinese uh, IWW branch um, in Chinatown in uh, New York City. Uh, it was led by a philosophy student from Columbia named, named uh, Gray Wu. Um, and he had organized, uh, he, was, he was organizing Chinese restaurant workers in Manhattan. And so he was targeted. Um, he was at, you know, people know, people probably don't know Chinatown as well as I do, but Mott Street in New York City's Chinatown is pretty, it's sort of the center of uh, Chinatown life. And it was at 33 Mott Street, which is, uh, actually I stayed there one time, many years ago. Um, so um, he was pretty severely beaten. Um, and, um, you know, the uh, 
communists did relatively little in the IW in those in the Palmer raid to defend Chinese people. Then in 1922, there was an important Supreme Court case in which a Japanese uh, uh, resident of the United States attempted to win a naturalization citizenship in the United States. And Ozawa in 1922, that Supreme Court case affirmed that only whites and Negroes were uh, eligible to become citizens. Unless, and Chinese could not become citizens, Japanese could not become citizens, unless they were born on US soil. And then in 1924, the Immigration Act uh, of 1924 ended nearly all Asian immigration. Uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1930s, um, the US was engaged with the events in China. People might remember the, you know, the, the State Department China experts, Owen Lattimore, Philip Yaffe, um, other leading people from the State Department who were involved in events in China. And many recognized the corruption of the Guomindang and they became much more important as the war progressed into the, into the 1940s and the US became involved. Um, in 1943, because of the war, China, the US actually abolished the, the, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, that was just a goodwill gesture towards China, which was doing a significant, China did a significant amount of the fighting in World War II, but gets very little credit for it. So uh, here's a rhetorical question. What, what country suffered the greatest number of people killed during World War II? Well, I would have, I mean, people, most people might say the Soviet Union, but actually China did. China suffered more deaths in World War II than the Soviet Union did. And we know, we have a, most people know how severe the fighting was on the Eastern Front and how many Soviet people lost their lives in that war. Um, by 1945, the war is over and, you know, China enters this period of internal revolution. Who will control? Will it be the Guomindang? Will Mao win? So during this period, the, uh, the American diplomats were involved in negotiations between Mao and the Guomindang. And, um, you know, as it turned out, Mao won. So um, this raised an interesting question in the US Congress who lost China? You see, China belongs to the US. Does everybody understand that? Because it was US blood, US fortune that defeated Japan. It wasn't the Germany that defeated, it wasn't England, it wasn't Russia. It was US treasure and US blood that defeated Japan in China. And China belonged, the, the sense in Congress was China belongs to us. And instead we were stabbed in the back by Stalin and he turned on us after agreeing that Chiang Kai-shek should be the ruler. Stalin stabbed us in the back and supported Mao and Mao won. And so China went communist who lost China. Well, the, the American diplomats um, who were pro Mao or at least not strong enough pro Chiang Kai-shek, they took the fall uh, for that. And um, there was a, the China experts had a magazine uh, called Amer Asia Magazine, and it uh, began publishing in the late 30s and published right up until 1945. It was the leading sort of uh, uh, analysis of what's really happening in China, who the, what are the different forces at play. It was pretty objective, and it was all it was all articles by many of the articles were by State Department um, people. Uh, Andrew Roth, Philip Jaffe, Kate Mitchell, Mark, and Mark Gay, and all the leading likes um, of the period. Uh, and uh, the Cold War, I would say the Cold War began with their arrest. Uh, on uh, June 7th, 1945, um, the FBI arrested, uh, arrested uh, the, shut down the, uh, the, the magazine, Amerasia, arrested the editors. And when they searched the offices, they found uh, papers from John Stewart that there were papers that had been prepared um, for the American government. 
and yet these confidential papers were in the possession of the staff at Amer Asia magazine. I guess because the authors gave them to their magazine. But anyway, so that was the basis for the charges against the China experts. So that you know issue of we're too young to remember this, but in the 1950s, the issue of who lost China was a powerful driver of anti-communism and anti-Chinese sentiment in, in the United States. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the period of the 1960s, the Vietnam War, uh, probably, I would say 19, by 1965, um, the US was really concerned about China's support for, the, for Vietnam, which was, very, which was really an immense level of support. China was devoting something like 10% of the GNP to help Vietnam in, in the war in the beginning in 65 or so. And there, they provided 100,000 people to many as aircraft stations in the North. They, um, they took a lot of casualties when the American bombed the anti-aircraft guns and, and missiles. So they played a pretty significant role um, in the defense of the North. Um, and um, there has been Chinatown in San Francisco has been the site of the of immense and historic battles between pro pro communist pro China and anti China forces um, in Chinatown, and it has gone on ever since the period of the United Front uh, during World War II, when both sides were working together to win the war. As soon as the as the a revolution took place in China. Um, Chinatown opinion divided. Some people supported the Chinese government. Other people supported the Kuomintang. And the FBI was extremely interested in trying to recruit agents and people they could have an influence in China or, and find out what's going on in China. Hopefully, um, try to influence the go through the hell of, being, of interrogations on Angel Island, sometimes for months and months. And it was just a very bitter um, battle to, for Chinese people to immigrate to the, to the United States. And it turned out many people had to use these extra legal means to um, establish relationships that didn't really exist. So that many of the residents of Chinatown by the 1960s were people who had, um, who had, who had a very, who had still an uncertain status because of the illegal documents that they had used. So in the late fifties, the Hong Kong American consulate began emphasizing this problem, that there is all these unreliable Chinese people living in San Francisco and elsewhere. How many of them are communist agents? We really don't know. And so, the FBI, through its influence over the pro Guomindang, you know, pro Taiwan um, family associations in China, convinced them that the family associations should, should inform on their own members. So there was a, so they tried to convince the family associations and the um, Chinatown social organizations, the ones that were pro Guomindang actually told their people that they should confess. If you're a paper son, you should come forward now. You should confess that you're here illegally, and then we'll work out some kind of deal for you, and the Americans will allow you to stay. So many, many hundreds of people in San Francisco, Chinatown, turned themselves in, and they were pretty much all deported. <laughs> there was nothing done for them, because the hostility to China and to Chinese people was so great after the revolution in 1949, 
that this was just a ruse to get rid of people and created a really intense uh, a period of hatred of Chinese people that uh, was really extreme during the McCarthy period. Um, and the Taiwan Security Service was operating in uh, Chinatown, then operates in the US. Um, they got in the Taiwan Security Service, got in some trouble in 1984 when they murdered a journalist. Um, what happened was there was a, a very well known Chinese journalist named Henry Liu. Uh, and he wrote a biography of Chiang Kai shek's son. Chiang Kai, Chiang Kai shek was succeeded by his son, Jiang Qingguo. And so it turned out that John Jingguo was in charge of the Taiwan Security Service with the leader of the, you know, Taiwan's equivalent of the FBI, CIA. So uh, Henry Liu, who wrote the book, actually served in the same service. <laughs> he served in the Taiwan Intelligence Service. And his boss, I mean, he knew the leader of the service, John Jingguo. So he wrote an extremely accurate, truthful, uh, biography of John Jingguo, and it made the guy look terrible because of all the corruption, all the terrible things that the, the Taiwan Security Service had done. And so the Taiwan Security Service just decided to murder him. And they did. That happened in October of 1984. This created a big problem for the FBI, which has always been active in Chinatown. It's the counterintelligence service trying to catch the Chinese spies and so forth. But this created a problem for them because they were, have been working, they work very, very closely with the Taiwan Security Service. And so it was kind of a stain on the FBI that they would allow this to happen. And so the Congress, the American Congress, passed legislation barring the FBI from working with the Taiwan Security Service. But you know, how effective that would be, I, you know, I don't think you know today. But. It was one of the embarrassments that happened. There were a series of other, there are constant spy scandals. Whenever diplomatic relations with the US and China go bad, like right now, there is always attempts by the uh, security services of the US to uh, frame up um, anyone who's pro-China or maybe anyone who's just Chinese who works in, any, that, who works in the uh, in high technology portions of the uh, uh, the American economy, people with, who you know are studying uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons, or you know people who are involved in cutting edge technology of any kind, Chinese people in universities. There have been a, quite a few people, Chinese people, targeted just in the past few past year or so, framed up. The usual pattern is the FBI charges you with a bunch of spurious spying charges. You spend a million dollars court and the judge throws it all out. That's kind of been the pattern. But you know, it ruins people's lives. It's an it has a political meaning beyond the actual intelligence efforts. It's to warn China that the US is coming after them. And to warn Chinese people not to support China. So these have more of a very important, although the, the prosecutions usually fail, the political impact is very significant. And, Chinese uh, academics are really under the gun now and they're frightened. Um, and as things get worse, there would be increasing danger. Many have returned to China. People are being forced out. Um, Chinese students who are in the STEM, you know, science, technology, people uh, in the STEM um, areas of study are under scrutiny by the US. They're, the US is denying visas to Chinese students who wanna to come to the US to study science and technology. And this all plays out as part of the, um, the hostility, increasing hostility of China. And to Chinese people, you can't be hostile to China without being hostile to Chinese people. And, and I think the, the hatred, um, the attacks on Chinese people, I think these flow principally from governmental American imperialist efforts to uh, punish China and to target uh, Chinese um, academics and it has a spillover that's pretty intense. You know, um, I think the way the media covers the hundreds of attacks we've seen on Asian people in the past um, in the past six months or so, the way the media covers it, oh, it's COVID. Well, oh, they're blamed, uh, you know, Chinese people are blamed for, you know, mistakes that the Chinese government made in 
you know, the uh, COVID program. So they all the states. So the reason why people are being are beating up Chinese people is because it's not. <laughs> it's because there is a growing hostility to China, and it's pretty uniform across. The, it's not political conservatives who are um, behind this. You know, this uh, the um, hostility to China. It's the liberals. It's the present administration. It's Joe Biden. Um, you know, the Quad, Bernie Sanders, all of them are very strongly anti-China now. And um, to, an, to a large extent, I think that the entire labor program of the Democratic Party, insofar as it has any labor program, is the labor program is to sanctions against China, and you will get more American jobs if we do that. We're going to punish the Chinese, we're going to sanction them. And then some of the things that are produced in China will then be produced here. We'll have more American jobs. It's a, it, it's a fantastic idea because the US doesn't really have the infrastructure to build the, uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, commodities that China can build. China it just has the infrastructure, the shipping, the containers, the ships, everything necessary, the factories, and the engineering skill to really outproduce the US now in, in sort of low end commodities, not in high end, not in, not in technology, but in the day to day commodities that, you know, um, and food that American people rely on, the Chinese uh, American companies produce most of those goods in China now. The American companies do not produce those goods in the United States. So it's kind of wacky to suggest that punishing China is going to create jobs in the United States, but I think there, but I really think that is a significant promise of the liberal pro-labor um, people like Sanders um, in the United States. So the US, um, you know, in, in 2020, people may remember that Secretary of State Pompeo um, made a, the most hard-edged anti-China presentation we've heard yet. I, it hasn't been beaten in my opinion. And uh, among other things, he uh, identified my organization, the US China People's Friendship Association, and another organization, the Committee for the Peaceful Unification um, of Taiwan. Those two organizations he identified as um, espionage fronts for the PRC. So it makes it, you know, you want to join the Friendship Association? Well, you know, that's an espionage front um, for the Chinese government. Um, and we're seeing as China, uh, China is a much stronger country than it was 20 years ago. China is growing rapidly. Uh, these are things that worry US imperialism and Japanese imperialism. Um, and uh, these are really, we are seeing a, uh, the, the left and the right in the US creating political programs to contend with these, with the changing uh, politics of imperialism and the growth of China. So uh, the left has done a fairly poor job, in my opinion, in defending the rights of Chinese people. Um, you know, this Communist Party, USA, supported the Japanese internment as part of their support for the, you know, the New Deal Roosevelt um, promises. Um, the Working Man's Party, in the um, in the San Francisco, in the 19th century, part of the first international, by the way, um, that they were the leaders of the purges, demanding purges of Chinese people, brutally lynching Chinese people in San Francisco. Um, that was the Working Men's Party. So the left has had a pretty, I think, a, a poor. Um, uh, response in defending the rights of Chinese people and defending the rights of international workers rather than simply American workers. And that continues today. The left today is very fractured. And as I say, insofar as the social Democrats are part of the left, and I, I think they, they are part of the broad left, they're extremely hostile to China. Uh, they have propaganda about China being a dictatorship. China is murdering people in the West. Uyghurs are all being, being killed in camps. Uh, in Hong Kong, they're suppressing all the democracy and freedom movements. 
oh my God, Taiwan, he'd be independent because it's a democratic, it's a great democratic place. It's, well, of course it's a country, it's not really part of China anymore. And, you know, so there was pretty significant support uh, uh, on the left, on the broad left for US imperialist initiative. Um, and even on the Mark, what I would consider the Marxist left, it's pretty, it's very strongly divided so that a minority of the Marxist left, I think supports China. There's only a few groups that have been openly um, supporting China against the US. Many of the left said that, you know, I think vision of China has restored capitalism or China now is actually not just capitalist, but Steve sent me an interesting article about China now being imperialist, not just capitalist. So that uh, there are all kinds of reasons for people to support their own bourgeoisie in a confrontation with uh, a socialist country like China. And so we are entering a fairly dangerous tumultuous period, I think, in US-China relations where maybe we will be tested. Maybe internationalists and communists who support um, who will not defend American attacks on China or other countries are gonna be tested somewhat. Um, and you know, all of the tools that the government has against us, uh, you know, the security service, the security services, the media, and many of these things uh, are becoming, are starting to move into action um, against China. And it's not at all surprising to me that Chinese people would be targeted we need to defend our Chinese comrades. Well, don't discriminate whether you're Chinese or broad perspective. And uh, the US imperialism is stoking this hatred now as part of a war preparation to try and push China back and for the US to assert its, uh, its power. Uh, uh, imperialist power over the world. I just wanted to say one interesting comment I have is, I hope it's interesting, is that there is a new book called, um, by an author who's doing a trilogy, the historian doing a trilogy on the Pacific War, but it's from the perspective of China. Very unusual book. It's called, the first volume is called Tower of Skulls. Um, and it's, it's the Pacific War from 1931, really, the I would say World War II started in 31 with the invasion, Japan's invasion of the Northeast of China. But it starts from that period and covers the, the war from the Chinese perspective, mainly. Uh, World War II from the Chinese perspective. So the first volume is out, it's very interesting. You know, it's not a perfect book, it has some anti-communist, you know, memes in it, but, you know, it's much better than most of the other things I've seen. And um, it's an interesting book and there are two more volumes supposedly on the way. Okay, th thank you, David. And um, there, there is a, a movement inside the unions against uh, militarization in Asia and uh, against the uh, Asian pivot. And there have been discussions in, in the San Francisco Labor Council to challenge that and one of those people who's played a leading role in the labor movement in San Francisco in opposing militarization, the Asian pivot, is Roger Scott, who is past president of AFT 2121, is currently a delegate to the San Francisco Labor Council, and actually was able to get a resolution passed uh, uh, from the Labor Council opposing militarization of Asia, and also uh, defending the comfort women against the at attacks uh, on them. And uh, this, uh, is important, but obviously there has to be a lot more education work done in the labor movement to oppose militarization and to pit U.S. workers against uh, Chinese workers, Japanese workers, or Korean workers, which uh, is a very dangerous time. And it's led to a massive attack on Asian people in the United States, terrorism acts and, and others. So uh, welcome, Roger Scott. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Steve, and good evening to all. Um, Appreciate the opportunity to share my views with my distinguished panelist comrades. Um, first of all, I'd like to add that in my many years of union work, uh, I've been on the executive board of, I was on the executive board of AFT 2121 for more than 40 years. And, and uh, 
I have good things to say and met an ample criticism of the union movement in this country. I think our greatest successes have been on the economic front, but I think the American labor movement has a shameful past in two areas, especially racism and failure to oppose interventionist wars. And it's, it's very important that we do a better job on both fronts. <coughs> Excuse me. And I also don't have much to say about Hong Kong, except to say that I think it's, uh, generally I support demonstrations and I think some of the grievance, some of the people, uh, the people in Hong Kong have some legitimate grievances but I think they're attacking the wrong people. I think it's the British colonial past, past and neo-colonial intervention and not their enemy is not the Beijing government. In my view, it's, it's a much, much more a protest against socialism than, than a protest in pro-democracy. I think that's a great misnomer. Well, my role as a teacher uh, has been in four countries and five states of the US in more years as a social and union activist. <clears throat> and what I've learned from, from the best minds I've been exposed to have led me to believe that the most prevalent forms of injustice and human suffering are based on racial and economic injustice. And I think the two most politically instructive periods of my life were 1963 to 65 when I served in the Peace Corps in Bogota, Colombia. And in 1968, 69 when I lived in Tokyo. In Colombia, uh, that was uh, during the escalation of our involvement of our intervention in Vietnam. And every chance I got, I wrote um, even a little bit of some journalistic articles opposing that intervention and criticizing the, the minds of the, the, poli the, the minds who framed that interventionist hysterical anti-communist policy. And in, <clears throat> in Tokyo, I was very active in the war and anti-war activities and try and, and, and try worked with Chinese groups trying to establish diplomatic ties with the People's Republic of China and was on the Quaker yacht Phoenix that tried to sail to China in 1969. And that resulted in uh, being my being incarcerated altogether for 57 days by the Japanese immigration. And, and to protest at first, I went on a hunger strike the only time in my life and had only water for nine days and lost 35 pounds. And ultimately I was deported in 1969. Um, of the many heroic and humane people I try to learn from and emulate as best I can, I regard John Brown as the most revolutionary and Martin Luther King as the wisest and most humane. Uh, briefly tonight, I'd like to focus primarily on King's speech of August 4th, 1967, <clears throat> and its revolutionary interna internationalist message that is as relevant today as it was in 1967, one year before his death. In fact, it's my strong belief that that sealed his doom as an activist in this country. Uh, exactly, you know, he, uh, he was a great spirit. By the way, the uh, I also have great respect for the wisdom and integrity of Dr. Mark Selden. I think some of you know of, of his work as a distinguished Asian scholar at <clears throat> Cornell University. Excuse my voice, I'm a little bit hoarse. Um, he recognized that in spite of US genocide toward the native peoples, for the stealing of their land and attempts to destroy their culture, uh, and also our institutionalizing slavery and perpetuating since systemic racism that still permeates our culture and institutions. The US, he said once, quote, played a significant role in defeating Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. However, since the end of World War II, the US has committed more war crimes than any other nation on earth. And I, I think that's accurate. The world needs visionary and courageous people who understand that those who try to divide the peoples of the world based on race, class, ethnicity, um, religion, language, ideology, and national origin, origin are never true patriots of any nation, but are the enemies of all humanity. On April 4th, 1967, Martin Luther King delivered his Seminal speech at Riverside Church condemning the Vietnam War. 
declaring my conscience leaves me no other choice. And it, I think it's kind of an unfortunate commentary on our national uh, educational system and, and consciousness that many, many people know of King's I Have a Dream speech, but very few people, even sophisticated people of the left, pay that much attention to his speech on Vietnam in 1967. And of all the speeches I've ever read, that resonates more with me and my political view and my role as a, as a conscientious person who would like to see change in the favor of humanity rather than technology and imperialism. Um, I'd like to share some of the experts, uh, excerpts from that exceptional speech that I regard as eminently rational, humane, and relevant to the global impact of the recent conversion of, convergence of the pandemic, the brutal but historically familiar murder of George Floyd, ongoing wars, raging, wildfire, fly, way, raging wildfires throughout the world, and other environmental disasters, massive poverty, worldwide hunger, uh, global racial injustice and the continuing threat of nuclear annihilation. But fortunately, in my view, all of those disasters have converged to awaken the world in ways that I never saw before in my years of activism. Uh, King followed with a historical sketch outlining Vietnam's devastation at the hands of, quote, deadly Western arrogance noting, quote, we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create a hell for the poor. Uh, some of the excerpts may be too long. If I read too much, too long, I'll stop. Uh, and also I would encourage all of you to read that eight page speech. And I think you're likely to conclude as I have that that's the, not only the greatest speech of his lifetime, but one of the greatest speeches in history. Um, he, he w was a preacher and, you know, Martin Luther King made fun of him as a preacher before they came to a meeting of the minds. And he said, since I'm a preacher by trade, I suppose it's not surprising that I've, that I have seven reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. Uh, there's more to that, but I want to go to the second section. Um, the war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we, excuse me, I, have to, I need my magnifying glass, small print. And if we, and if, if, and if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing clergy and laymen concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for those and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end unless there's a significant, profound change in American life and policy. Such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam, but not beyond our calling as sons of the living God. And again, uh, I'm an agnostic, but that's that inspires this old infidel. Continuing. Increasingly, by choice or by, by accident, this is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investment. I'm convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we're called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but will be only, that will be only an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. 
It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that as an edifice which produces beggars, that the, the an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasy, uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge amounts of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of Latin America and say, this is not just. The Western arrogance feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn uh, tells us that, the, the, that that is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of, of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Well, these are revolutionary times. All over the world, men are revolting against old system of exploitation and oppression and out of the wound, wombs of a frail world, new system of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these resolutions. It's a sad fact because of comfort, complacency, a morbid, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice the Western nations have initiated as much of, of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world and have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. Therefore, therefore communism is a judgment against our failure to, to make democracy and follow through the, on the revolution we initiated. Our only hope today lies in, in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring, I'm sorry, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. Well, um, I could go on more. It's a, I have a few other passages, but I think I, I'll stop there and I'd like to conclude briefly. Um, as in, we, when will, with a question, when will the people of this country learn that we, like people from every country on earth, are neither better nor worse than the rest of humanity, but simply part of that great river of humanity? As a teacher and unionist, I believe all levels of education should serve the spiritual and material needs of the people and that our unions and our government should be the brains and conscience of society. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Roger. And now we'll open it up for discussion or comments on the uh, presentations. People should put their hand up, go to reactions and put your hand up if you'd like to speak. And unmute yourself. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Miho had to leave, so she uh, sends her regrets that, to not be able to stay. Okay, thank you, Grace. I, I think um, one of the issues uh, that we have to face is that the, unfortunately, the national unions of the AFL-CIO and the Teamsters and the SEIU and uh, AFSCME and AFT have been silent about militarization. It's not an issue within the labor movement nationally. So the fact that the United States spends $750 billion a year on military uh, uh, empire of 800 bases is not an issue within the labor movement. That's something that has to change. The other thing I think is a decline of the United States 
as an imperial power, and I agree with Roger, uh, was American capitalists who, billionaires who wanted to make investments in China for more profit, um, they basically outsourced the industrial base of the United States to first the South and Mexico and then China, and now they blame China, when in fact it's American capitalists who uh, shut down factories here and moved to other countries for greater profits. Um, but the question is, whatever your position on, on China, and I, uh, I don't think uh, China is socialism, uh, whatever your position is, I think the, the labor movement has to take a position that their interest is not with uh, supporting militarization and attacks on China or on Russia or other countries. That the, uh, the main issue is fighting for the working class in this country. And that has to be a, a basic principle because one of the, the, I think, elements of the decline of the United States as an economic imperial power is the rise of fascism. And uh, when Trump was uh, whipping up a, a racist, xenophobic attack against uh, Asians, there was, there was silence by the, uh, the national trade unions, AFL-CIO. Nobody, not one national trade union leader challenged that and said, this is racist and xenophobic, called him out. And the same with, uh, you know, the uh, attack on black and brown people in this country. There was no national campaign by the unions against this uh, racism and xenophobia. And I think the labor movement has to organize to educate people about the dangers of this and fight it. And that's a critical if we're going to uh, really defend ourselves. Steve, one comment about AFT, my, my national union. Uh, some of you probably know that, you know that some unions have been complicit and some have been just silent. Well, uh, in, 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 the, in min the many forms of injustice we're talking about in AFT, played under Albert Shanker, played a key role in National Endowment for Democracy. The, the Shanker and others would, would go into Latin America, especially in the 60s and, so, and afterward, and, and create corrupt unions that sold out to people. And, and, um, and the, the FT is still, I'm sure, involved in National Endowment for Democracy. And they, that's one of the groups that's been funding the, the, the pro, quote, quote, pro democracy uh, protest in Hong Kong. And they, they've, they've had, in fact, uh, the journalist Warren Hinkle, uh, who's no longer with us, did a very good article one time in an independent paper titled AFL CIA, and uh, pointing out the connection between the AFL CIO and the CIA. And that's a that's that's not theoretical or or, uh, or paranoid. That's act that's an accurate description. 